In Pit Lane is proudly brought to you by Dino Tech by Dino Dynamics. For your nearest workshop, visit our website. And with the support of the Ramada Resort, Phillip Island. Hello everybody, welcome to another edition of InFit Lane. Yes, that magnificent crane shot that is for your consideration for next year's TV Week Logie Awards. Thank you very much, we hope you enjoyed it. We shall be repeating it again, possibly next week if you liked it. If you did, send us, some, send us an email to the show at inpitlane.com and tell us how much you enjoyed the crane shot. Got now, coming up on the program a little bit later, you might have noticed during the crane shot that we have a motorcycle in the studio. The reason we have a motorcycle in the studio is that we also have a motorcycle rider, not just any motorcycle rider. You'll be introduced a little bit later to Alan Kempster. Alan uh, has been racing for quite a number of years, but uh, he's, well, he's, he's managed to overcome quite a few difficulties, and quite frankly, uh, I have no idea how he does this. We're going to find out a little bit later exactly how he does. But uh, right now, as you saw, also saw on the wide shot, we have Michael Laminato alongside us, and uh, Mike, we have some news, but unfortunately we start off on, on a sad note. We do. Tonight we do start on a sad note with the news of the death of high-profile Winton and Wakefield Park promoter Mick Ronk. 66-year-old Mr Ronk passed away this morning after several years of health problems, none of which managed to keep him away from his beloved Winton Motor Raceway. Mr Ronk was also a leading figure in the establishment of the Australian Auto Sport Alliance, set up to provide grassroots races with an affordable alternative to the Confederation of Australian Motorsport. Tributes have been coming in all day for Mr Ronk from the Australian motor racing community. Mick was a guest on Inpit Lane on many occasions over the past 18 years, and we all pass on our sincere condolences to his friends and family. Western Australian hero Garth Tander celebrates two major milestones this weekend when the V8 Supercar Series returns to Barbagallo Raceway. It will be Tander's 200th V8 Supercar event and he'll also pass the mark of 450 individual race starts as well. The 35-year-old has competed in 449 championship races to this point, taking home an impressive total of 50 race wins, the last coming at Bathurst in 2011. Tander won all three races at Barbagallo in 2007 after qualifying on pole position. He also took pole for the Saturday race at the circuit last year, but was taken out in a first lap accident. Meanwhile, the V8 supercar races of tomorrow were in South Australia last weekend for the latest round of the CIK Stars of Karting series. Dutch driver Joey Hansen fought back from his round one defeat to turn the tables on reigning series champion Chris Hayes and claim the pro gearbox win at Bolivar. The pair split the heat race victories on Saturday before Hansen won the pair of 34 lap main events on Sunday. Queenslander Kyle Ensbury was second ahead of Hayes who now holds a 12 point lead in the chase for the championship. But for Hansen, it was the perfect weekend. I put Paul new lap record. Um, I won every time when I finished the race so I'm really happy with it, yeah. The Pro Junior races were wide open affairs with Liam McClellan and James Abella dicing it out with series rookies Jake Koteski and Bryce Fullwood near the front of the field over the weekend. Kostecki and McClellan shared the victories on Sunday. Kostecki won the opening final before McClellan proved too good in the second race to take his second successive round victory. It was definitely a lot about uh, tyre saving uh, because this track's very technical and we managed to come out on top, which was uh, definitely a great result for the OK1 chassis and the Shamik Racing team. And Victorian George Duranis broke through for his maiden victory in the pro light class. Starting from pole, Duranis claimed a lights to flag win in the second 34 lap race. Cosmic Racing Australia driver Matthew Waters pressured Duranis right down to the wire, but despite his best efforts, the Sydney sider was unable to find a way past. The Victorian relieved to have finally broken through. Just, it's just like a monkey coming off my back. Like um, I've had so much bad luck over the years. I run up there with the boys, but just finally to just come through for uh, just the win, it's just words can't describe the feeling. It's just, yeah. I'm just, they're so lifelike. I'm just wondering where you put the batteries in. 
Hello, yes, welcome back to In Pit Lane, wherever we are, whatever camera we're on. I think we're on camera too. Hello, everybody. Yes, this is, uh, this, I should introduce you to Billy. This is Billy. Say hello, Billy. No, Billy's not saying hello any, at, at all. Billy is, in fact, the companion of our guest tonight. He is Alan Kempster. Alan is a motorcycle racer, but not just any motorcycle racer. He's overcome some incredible odds to get back on the, on the back of a bike, and uh, how he does it, I have no idea, so let's ask him. Welcome, Alan Kempster. Alan, uh, welcome thanks to for having me. Lane. Thanks for having me uh, tonight, Brett. And uh, no thanks for bringing Billy in as well. But I take it Billy travels with you everywhere. Uh, yeah, Bill travels uh, all over Australia, and he comes to uh, talks with me and does a few talks, and... Yeah, he, uh, usually uh, almost wherever I go, except to, for the racetrack. He can't go to the racetrack, so. No, that's, that's it. It's, it's, there are dogs and racetracks sort of uh, mutually exclusive. We've got to find out. I mean, sort of when some, one, of our, one of our viewers, your friend of yours, Carrie, has, has, has written into us and told us and said, look, we've got this guy, he's a motorcycle racer. And we thought, yes, that's fine, that's good. And then they said, but he's also sort of minus two limbs. Now, I, I just couldn't believe how you sort of managed to ride a motorcycle with, when, without the, the benefit of a right arm and a right leg. But before we go into that, first of all, let's go back to the beginning. In fact, how you, uh, how you lost the, the limbs? What happened? Uh, in 1990, I had a uh, motorcycle accident on the road. I was hit by a hit-run driver, and that caused a traumatic amputation in my right arm and right leg. Uh, I lost them at the accident site. Um, I spent around uh, a week in intensive care and a further three weeks in hospital. And then uh, I moved um, to a rehabilitation centre for around 12 months. And that's where I learnt to walk and do everything else and, yeah, sort of got back into it. So what do you, what do you remember, of anything, about the accident? Uh, I can't remember four hours before the accident. I can remember waking up in intensive care. Um, and the first thing that I was concerned about... Um, because I had so many tubes and that in my throat, um, I couldn't talk. And people were thinking that I was, I wanted my arm, and I was worried about my arm, but uh, I actually had my other dog with me the day that I had my accident. Um, his name was Ralph, and I was more concerned about Ralph than I was my arm and leg, so, yeah, so, yeah. So obviously it's an incredibly traumatic thing to, to have happen to you. I mean, at what point, sort of when you woke up, did you, what point did you realise that your injuries were as severe as they, as they were? Well, um, pretty much, so I was in and out of it for, a, like I said, uh, around seven days. I was operated on every second day. But it was sort of like the next morning that I realised that, um, that I'd lost my arm and leg. Um, by the time I come out of intensive care and things like that, I sort of realised that, I had nothing else to do but get on with my life. Um, so yeah, I just chose to get on with my life. So how did you, I mean, I take it there would be inc an incredible amount of rehab. At what point during that rehab did you suddenly decide, I'm going to jump on the back of a motorcycle again? Well, I, I always wanted to um, ride a motorbike again. Um, but actually, six weeks after my accident, I got out of hospital and I went down to my mate's farm and had an old XT250. Uh, we threw the throttle onto the left-hand side and off I went down the paddock. And I um, stalled it down the back of the paddock. And I couldn't, 20 odd years ago, back in 1990, they didn't really have electric starts back on dirt bikes and things like that. And I just sort of thought, this is too hard, you know, it's too difficult, I couldn't restart the bike. So that was basically the last time I rode the bike for around 20 years. Um, and while I was in rehab, someone mentioned about water skiing. So I um, took up water skiing. I'd never water skied before, and I thought, oh, yeah, a bit of adrenaline. Um, so I took up water skiing, and I ended up representing Australia for 10 years in disabled world skiing. I skied in five world championships uh, basically all around the world. Um, I won, I, I won my last world championship in uh, 2001, where I retired after winning my last world championship. And um, that, that took up the first 10 years of my life after my accident. And then the next 10 years, I spent uh, working in the industrial industry, uh, sorry, the tourist industry. Uh, and I used to captain a 50-seat cruise boat around Lake Mawala. Um, that being seven days a week in the tourist industry. Um, I never went to a motorbike race or anything over the 10 years. And then I decided that I wanted to get back into motorbike racing. Um, I was getting to uh, around 50 years old, and I thought, well, I've, I've always had a dream of opening up a disabled motorcycle race school. So I thought I'd better go out and prove myself first. Um, 
make a name for myself um, so I can sort of start up this uh, disabled riding school. So yeah, I've been racing for around, around four years now. So how would you, I mean, for somebody who's, you know, knows a, uh, only a bit about motorcycles, not being a motorcycle rider myself, yeah. I would think I can understand with a car, you've got that situation where you're basically just steering the car. With a bike, it's all about, about using your body. Your body becomes a part of the, uh, a part of the machine. Yeah. Um, how, did, how did you overcome that? And how did you get on when you say you just sort of jumped on the bike? It's sort of a matter of fact, like you just jumped on and away... You went, was it that easy? Pretty, pretty much, yeah, basically it was. Um, the thing I had problems with, though, was um, just getting my mind set around the controls that I've got um, because my uh, front brake and clutch lever are on the same hand. Uh, my clutch lever is just below, we'll, we'll show that a little later, is just below the brake lever. And just on change down, you normally blip the clutch on change down. And uh, what I was doing, I was blipping the clutch, but I was actually grabbing a handful of front brake as well um, the back wheel was leaving, leaving the ground and almost hitting me in the head. And I used to run off the track a little bit. So I, I just totally stopped using the uh, clutch on downshift now. I only use the clutch actually to take off and um, stop and start. Yeah, and um, now I've just got used to squeezing the brake a little softer and, and yeah, I don't have as many runoffs anymore. So it's pretty good. So what was the attitude of, uh, of other competitors and, and the motorcycle racing authorities when you sort of uh, popped in and uh, said you wanted to race again? Um, well, I, I sort of um, tried to join a few clubs and get a licence and all that, and I tried to talk to uh, the officials, and I sort of, they sort of um, didn't take me too seriously. Um, so anyway, I ended up joining a club, um, uh, getting my racing licence and everything. I just sent off all the forms. I rocked up to Winton one day for my first race meeting and I, had, I run the number half on my bike as I'm half a man. <laughs> and um, I, I actually asked them if I could have the number half and they said, um, yeah, I could have the number half. I rock up the track and the first thing they noticed was the number. And they, then they looked at the rest of the bike and they sort of thought, well, they actually seen the right hand side and they, they seen it had, didn't have a brake or throttle on it and they said you can't bring your bike up when it's not ready. And I showed them the other <laughs> side. Showed them the other side. Um, well, we're going to have a look at the bike in a, in a second, we're going to take a break now but yep. uh, we're, we're going to get up we're going to have a look at the bike because you've made a lot of modifications to it and we'll have a look at that when we come back on In Pit Lane. We'll let, we'll let Billy get back onto terra firma again. If you're watching <laughs> In Pit Lane we'll be back with our special guest Alan Kempster right after this break. Why should you get your car tuned with a Dynotech Dyno? Your car will be more fuel efficient. An accurate tune means saving money at the pump. Your car is safe. It never has to leave the workshop to be tested. Increased performance. Optimise fuel consumption and more power. Reduced emissions. Protect the environment by minimising your carbon footprint. To find your nearest Dynotech workshop, go to www.dyno.com.au. Dynotech by Dyno Dynamics. Welcome back to In Pit Lane, coming to you live from the studios of RMITV Student Television. Now, as you can see, we've uh, gone up from behind the desk and we're here next to Alan's motorcycle right here. Before we start on some of your modifications, give us a general view. What is, what is the bike itself? Uh, the, the bike is a 1993 Kawasaki ZX-R400, uh, four-cylinder. Um, it's capable of around speeds up to 450 kilometres an hour at Phillip Island. Um, well, that's adequate. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's, um, it's pretty quick. Um, I enjoy it because it's not too uh, powerful bike. It's quite easy to ride. Um, the little 400s, um, they don't wheel spin as much as the 600s and the 1000s out the corners. It's just a little bit more predictable. And it's um, a really enjoyable bike to ride. So let's talk about the specific modifications you've, you've made to the bike. Obviously, yep. obviously, everything that was on the right has had to be transferred over to, to the left, yeah. which is, uh, pre pre presents a few challenges. Yep. Take us through and show us what you've done over here, you know, perhaps starting down at the back with the gearbox uh, and the rear brake. Well, firstly, uh, the main um, modification I did, you've got the uh, left foot gear change, which is standard, and I've just fitted a rear brake lever um, just above the uh, foot peg. So when I um, just... I can change down and just use the rear brake uh, when I like. Um, the other main modifications I've got is a uh, left-hand throttle. Now the throttle twists the normal way and uh, returns. Uh, on the bottom here I've uh, got a clutch lever and the top lever is my front brake. Uh, and just um, when I'm pulling up at the line I just have to uh, jiggle the brakes and the clutch um, as I pull up um, and then I release the 
release the brakes and then I have to actually get my fingers under the clutch. Uh, I rev the bike to around uh, 8,000 revs and then I just basically ease the clutch out, um, float the front wheel and away we go. And, take it off. and then from that point you don't use the clutch because you were saying before that you, you had a bit of a problem yeah. when you first started with hitting the hitting the clutch and but as the you can see, as you can see here because I um, actually have to uh, just have some fingers on the clutch. Um, if you're going to pull the clutch lever in, you're automatically pulling the front brake in sort of thing, and that was causing me to. Uh, pull the front lever too hard and the back wheel was coming off the ground and I used to run off the track quite a bit so I just don't use the clutch anymore. Uh, I only use the clutch to actually uh, stop and start and I just actually um, ram it through the gearbox. <laughs> so what category do you run in? Uh, well it's just, um, the 400 so I race in um, Formula 400, uh, pre-modern and there's a couple other classes we've got as well. So we race against uh, the, the top 125 riders up to um, 750s. Yeah. I mentioned the, the thing about you know, using your body. We've got some footage on right now. You are at least in Creek or Sydney Motorsport Park, of course, it is, as it is now. Just uh, tell us, how, how difficult is it when you don't have that sort of other side that you can use yeah. to, to get through? How difficult is it, especially with quick changes of direction well, that sort of thing? Of course, so it's got a steering dampener on it, which, um, which is pretty important. It's probably, um, I have my steering dampener probably a little bit tighter than anyone else's. It stops uh, head shakes. Uh, with the right-hand corners, I can get off the bike but uh, I don't have a knee um, to feel the ground. So if you do actually look on the right hand side, you can see the fairing scrapes. I just um, lay it over until the, until the fairing scrapes. Um, and I've got a very short stump as well. So when I get off the bike on the left hand side, my stump just hangs onto the tank. Um, Wint and sweeper, the bumps around the wind and sweeper, they can cause me a bit of problems when they want to bounce me off. But um, well, you were saying well, you mentioned about about bumps and the fact that also because you're down low on the thing, you've got problems with your sternum as well. Yeah, yeah, I wear a, uh, a, a thorax protector, um, but just I when I'm off the bike, say on the left hand side, I've got me. Uh, my chest on the tank, and just all the bumps and the vibration causes a lot of problems with my sternum. So. Um, we sort of got over that with the thorax protector though, and I've actually raised the bars too. I've got two and a half inch raise, uh, raises on the bar, so I've just lifted the bars up a little bit higher just to get the pressure off my chest. So uh, how many races would you do a year? Oh, uh, last year I did about ten, um, but I did, I, I never actually did any full series. I raced in the Victorian Championships, I raced in the Interclub, uh, Preston Championship, Hartwell Championship. Uh, I raced at the Barry Sheen up at Eastern Creek. Yeah, so I sort of do a few races here and there, basically as many um, as I can afford them. Uh, yeah. Um, this year I raced up at the Barry Sheen this year. Uh, I came uh, fifth overall out of, I think there was 17 riders in my class. I came and fifth overall. And um, I bet two of um, New Zealand's <laughs> best riders, two New Zealand A grade four, um, 400 riders. So I was pretty happy with that. And I've also been invited over to the Burt Munro Challenge over in Invercargill oh, right. in New Zealand. Uh, so I'm going over there in November and I'll be doing the Bluff Hill Climb, which is a bitumen hill climb. Uh, my New Zealand pronunciation isn't very good, so we'll just say a, a, a race circuit and also I'll be doing a, a street circuit as well. And we hope that hopefully they'll be finding a motocross bike and I'll be able to do the beach race and race on the same um, beach as Bert Munro used to. Well, that's incredible. I suppose one of the things is obviously sponsorship is coming. Is that something that you're, you're looking for at the moment? Yeah, well, we're looking for sponsorship um, to race the, well, the next season um, and just to get over to New Zealand. Uh, but yeah, it should be good fun. Now I tell you that Billy won't be able to wander across New Zealand. Well, with I'm, you either. I'm actually looking into quarantine laws because I think the quarantine laws have changed now. You don't need a passport, so I don't know about quarantine. So he might come with me yet. I'm not too sure. There. Well, he's, he's being attended to at the moment. He's very ha happy right now. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people, when we said that we were having you on the show, we got a lot of responses on the Facebook page. A lot of people said, you know, how good it was and how much of an inspiration you had you had been to them. Yeah. Under those circumstances, I mean, what message do you give to people when you go out and you give your talks? And what's the message you'd like to you'd like to leave with people? Um, well, just mainly get off your bum and do something. You know, if you, if you've got a passion, follow it through. At, whether it's motorbike racing, horse riding, or yachting, or um, community television. Hey, community television. If you've got a passion, follow it. You know, and and you can do it. It is um, a, a lot of people. 
uh, even when I'm at a race meeting now and I'm in my wheelchair because I, when I haven't got my leg on I need to use a wheelchair and I'll have my leathers on and a racer may not have seen me before and a racer will look at me and go, oh, he must be a sidecar passenger. <laughs> Yeah, and then when they see me actually on a bike, they're, they're, they're stunned. So it, um, it spins a few people out. Um, I'll definitely get, a, get some looks. Uh, but it, it's just encourage people to, to get back into life and do what they do best and what they enjoy. So, yeah. Well, you've clearly got a great passion for it because it's just, uh, just, it's just an incredible story. And the, the way you, you do this is, is, is an inspiration to everybody. Thanks for coming down. Alan's come all the way down from Yarrawonga, um, and, and we thank you for that, bringing both Billy and the bike down there. We really do appreciate it. But for now, Alan Kempster, thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Thanks. Thanks for having us. And thank you to you at home. Now, we'll be back next week on the program. All the news from uh, Barbagello Raceway, all the news from the World Endurance Championship. Remember, inpitlane.com, live telecast of the World Endurance Championship this Sunday night. Until we see you next week from all of us here in Pit Lane, including Billy the Dog, good night. Good night.